welcome to Market Savvy Conversations. My name is Megan Walker, and today our special guest is Dr. Chris Moy. Hi, Chris. How are you? G'day. Dr. Chris Moy is a full-time GP from Adelaide. He graduated from the University of Adelaide in '91 and worked as a general in general practice for over 25 years. Chris's specific interests include aged care, palliative care, and health communication systems. Chris is the current federal AMA vice president, and prior to this was the chair of the federal AMA ethics and medico legal committee for four years. And Chris has also recently completed his term as AMA South Australia president. And Chris, you're involved in lots of initiatives related to aged and end of life care, as I see here. Um, very impressive bio, including the expert advisory panel of the South Australian Advanced Directives Review, the South Australian Health End of Life Decision Making Project, the GP Partners GP Palliative Shared Care Program, and the South Australia Health End of Life Prescribing Working Group. Now, all of that is important because it's led you, I believe, to your current work. Um, the aspiration of making a patient's advanced care directive available alongside their health information at the point of care led Chris to significantly involve himself in the development of digital health in Australia and particularly the My Health record, telehealth and electronic prescribing, which is what we're talking about today. Chris is currently a clinical reference lead of the Australian Digital Health Agency, as well as being a member of its Privacy and Security Advisory Committee. Well done, Chris, you're a busy man. I really appreciate you giving us your time today. So kick us off, tell us a little bit about what is the role of the Digital Health Agency just to help set the scene? Who does it govern um, and what's it all about? So the Australian Digital Health Agency is a, a government funded organisation, both federal and state government, um, uh, set up to really promote digital health in Australia for the benefit of patients, but also to improve the, the systems that are currently in um, health and, and across health so that they work better and improve the, the safety of the systems, but also to improve the quality of care that's provided to patients by streamlining them and making them more functional over time. Okay, fantastic. So a lot of the people watching our video or listening to this podcast will be private practice business owners, specialists, allied health GPs. And so what I really wanted to touch on today from your expertise is the obligations of those business owners, the really main key things that they need to be across uh, and aware of and have in place to protect, firstly, against cyber security in their practice. And then we'll, we'll talk about patient security as well. But can you start with cyber security as a key point for well, us? Yeah, well, essentially, um, you know, the, 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 with with the world going now, I've come from a world where we used to have everything on paper, um, and it was kind of simpler. But but all all the data that we have about patients, um, and you know, which is 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 available, important for providing the care, is now on these electronic systems. Uh, the key thing is that it must be protected. Now, first up, what I'd say to to all those um, uh, uh, business owners out there is well done. I mean, I think it's incredible and great what you do. Um, and I, I work out in, in, in general practice out, out out in the community and I realise how important that that work that you do it is. Um, the, the thing is, is that the thing to realise is that although, you know, your patients and your relationship with patients is your greatest asset, I think this, the, the second most important thing is actually the data you have about them. And I think you really feel that if ever your, your practice is actually hacked into, which does happen sometimes. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, you do hear stories about that or when your system goes down or, for example, unfortunately, where there have been situations where there have been instances of even things like ransomware and things like that have affected practices. So it is such a valuable thing and it's something you must really um, protect. Now, um, certainly there are uh, legal and, and obligations and sort of standard obligations, those things in terms of your requirements under the Privacy Act, for example, to have uh, reasonable protections in that area, but also with respect to standards, um, certainly things like the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners and other organisations have certain standards. And, and I have here, um, you know, a document, Information Security and General Practice, which is something worth looking from the RACGP. Yeah. Um, about the sort of obligations you have to, you know, 
protect the data that you have about patients. And, and they're really important. But I think the most important thing is to understand that what, and having been involved in digital health for a long time, and I know a couple of years ago, there was a lot of focus on the privacy and security of the My Health Record. Uh, look, what, what I'd have to say is the My Health Record is comparatively incredibly well protected. Uh, the, 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 real, the real concern and, and, and vulnerabilities in the system are really out of the community, uh, in private practice, for example, and, and practice is not really focusing enough on this area because, as I said, um, we, the, the, the biggest uh, single asset is your patients, but your second is your data about your patients. So really, please take it very seriously. Yeah. And you and I mentioned earlier you uh, have got, is it in that resource that you just held up where there's a checklist for yes. having a look at your cybersecurity and making sure what's in place? Is that, that's a document we'll link to below this video. Yeah, look, I, I, I know that for most of us, um, we're not uh, the, the most uh, IT savvy sometimes, or some of us are, but even then, uh, there are people who are far ahead of us, and they're particularly the hackers. Uh, now, what I'd say is that, you know, when you're setting up your practice, it can be very overwhelming, and particularly setting up your, your, uh, your the, the system, IT systems is incredibly complex for many of us. And so we often will get... Um, uh, uh, private or vendor uh, pr pr providers to provide this IT support. Now, the thing about it is, is we're often at a disadvantage in those situations. They often know a lot more than we do. And and it's really important that we feel as though we, we are getting what we need from them. And so the Australian Digital Health Agency has worked to develop a really I think really important sort of documents, which is uh, a document called questions to ask your IT vendors, which, um, and also an actual checklist, which you can actually give them. This is their paired document. You can actually give this to them or email this to them, ask them to fill it out. And from this, in fact, it'll actually allow you to score uh, the, the IT uh, providers and actually indicate whether first up, they know what they're talking about, what they're providing to you is actually, um, you know, that you feel comfortable about the sort of protections and, and systems that they're putting in your, in your practice. Oh, what fantastic resources. Get it out of the gobbledygook and get into something that we can check off and go, yes. Yeah, there's a lot of gobbledygook and I think that yeah, part of the problem is, is that sometimes, um, uh, you know, our minds can get uh, spinning when an IT provider uh, starts talking to us and 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 we get uh, we get uh, convinced by the the gobbledygook um, and I think for us what we need really is are they actually doing what we need them to do as far as protecting our IT systems and those two resources I think are really helpful for uh, people setting up a practice. Brilliant. The other innovation that I wanted you to touch on is digital prescribing, how that works and how people can get involved with using it if they aren't already? Yeah, look, um, um, this this is a really great innovation that's come out of um, uh, COVID, really, although work in this has been going a, a long time. I think COVID, gave, it was the final pushover, particularly with the situation where we were able to do... Uh, uh, telehealth with patients and, and 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 provide care that way, but um, at the same time we still had these manual scripts were either faxed or sent by mail, which kind of didn't make sense. So essentially, electronic prescribing involves, and it's really fantastic. You're sitting a doctor sitting at a at a at a practice who may have just finished a telehealth consult. Essentially, all they need to do is to um, uh, write, essentially set up their scripts as if they're just about to print their scripts, but instead of printing it, they'll actually uh, send this out uh, by a QR code. So uh, very quickly, uh, it'll look something like that. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it goes instantaneously to the, the patient's phone and they can take that QR code to the practice and obtain the information. Now, that's the current system. Um, the, 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 there is a system that, that is going to come into effect uh, over the next few months, which is possibly even simpler which is called an active script list. Um, so that the, the one we've got now is called a token system. Uh, electronic um, active script list is essentially what will happen then is that a, a doctor again at the practice will, instead of actually uh, sending a text with the, the barcode, what they'll be able to do, in fact, is to... Um, um, just approve a prescription which uh, prescription list which is in the cloud, uh, in a secure cloud, and the, pra the patient, if they need the prescription, just has to turn up at a pharmacy, uh, 
provide details now obviously they'll have to provide enough um, information about themselves um, in terms of a hundred point check or something like that but at that point they'll then the pharmacy will then get the approval to uh, link into this script list and they'll see that the script has been approved and the, they'll be able to dispense the prescription which is uh, even simpler so that's what electronic prescribing looks like in Australia and or we'll, and we'll be moving to in the next little bit there'll be so many benefits for that I imagine lost scripts you know, multiple repeats, scripts from different doctors, the benefits will just go on and on, won't they? Oh, my patients love that at the moment. <laughs> I mean, I just so, so the, the thing at the moment is, uh, see, in the past what's happened is they may need a prescription and they've rung up for a prescription or they've, they've had that a telehealth consult and they because you'd, you'd written it, but then you either had to send it or you had to fax it to the pharmacy, you'd still send it or and or else you left it at the front desk and they still had to come in anyway. Now it goes straight to their phone and they can go straight to the pharmacy. And, and as I said, soon they won't even need to do that. They'll just need to go straight to the pharmacy. They won't even need the, the, the barcode or QR code. Wow. So good. And um, I get asked this question all the time. And so you're here, you can help me with this. <laughs> I don't know why I get asked this, but fax machines. Megan, when are we getting rid of fax machines? <laughs> well, I, I think it's starting to come towards us at the moment. So the thing we've really needed is a thing called uh, secure messaging to come into being in the next mm. little bit. Now, um, in Australia, that that has been there have been problems with developing that. So secure messaging is essentially a securely encrypted email, uh, where it's 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 encrypted, but also we know that uh, the person um, sending it is known to the person getting it, and it's very clear that the, 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 every end of this is covered over. Now the the problem with that has been that to some degree in Australia there has been um, not a lot of um, sort of uh, strategy in the development of this. So in the the absence of that, there's been a a lot of different providers um, you, you may you, and, and and a lot of these have um, provided you know different services and it's got a bit confusing it's become a bit like VHS versus beta they haven't talked to each other and so unfortunately Australia's made slow progress in this area now the Australian Digital Health Agency has understood all along that this is the the, the, the the big one we need to get to because what we want to be able to do one day is to get rid of fax. So instead of uh, faxing something, we write a letter, for example, we, uh, we, um, we securely message this directly to the hospital or to another doctor. Um, uh, or, for example, we could also send an email asking a question of them. Instead of phoning, chasing them, we can send an email to them. Well, uh, that is on the on, on getting towards that stage now. So there's a lot of work. So in South Australia, for example, there's a pilot project at the moment for um, secure messaging of um, all um, um, uh, referral letters to hospitals. Um, and there is, in fact, uh, getting towards the timeline to turning off fax. So you won't be able to fax your referral letters anymore because that's the way, we, you know, unbelievably, we're still in the 2021 faxing our referral letters to hospitals at the moment. Um, um, it will be that there, there is a timeline to turn that off. So essentially, what will happen is instead of uh, faxing it, you'll write your letter and you email it directly to the hospital. And uh, it has so much benefits. You make, yeah. there's no paper, you make sure it gets there um, and you automatically get a record of, of that it's got there and you know it's got there. Whereas at the moment we're faxing into oblivion and it's, I find faxing one of the scariest things we do. We never know who gets it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we, we're well and truly getting the green light for telehealth to continue post our pandemic world whenever that is. Um, what are your thoughts and recommendations for clinicians um, using telehealth in terms of privacy for clients? Um, double barrel question, so privacy one, but also opportunities for them to keep embracing telehealth. Yeah, look, telehealth is uh, the silver lining to some degree of COVID because um, with uh, certainly organisations like the Australian Medical Association have been pushing the government towards moving to telehealth for a long time, but there had been a sort of a, a reluctance to get there, but COVID has shown the, the need uh, for it. What's great now is I think everybody really understands not only that it's more convenient, but it also actually increases access to care for a lot of people who are, for example, have been able to access care in the past. So, for example, those who can't get out of the house or rural remote areas it has a place so it's not it's not the the solution to everything because there's some things that have to be done face to face what i'd say to most uh practices developing at the moment is that the, the government's view is there's that it's certainly a tool in the provision of care it's not the be all and end all 
Um, so again, it fits in that place of actually prov providing convenience and also um, um, uh, increased access for, for patients, but you also need to build it within a, a good quality practice and also to provide face-to-face -face care because there's definitely a, a role for that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that there are um, emerging technologies that are available out there for um, particularly video conferencing which uh, and, and video, uh, video type telehealth, which I think are the ultimate and certainly much better than just telephone. So at the moment, unfortunately, most of telehealth is done by telephone and we'd like to move towards video. Now, um, certainly um, at various stages, um, we're, during this pandemic, a lot of practices and a lot of doctors have been forced to use things like, um, you know, FaceTime and things like that, which technically uh, don't really comply with the full privacy requirements that, 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 that uh, you know, that, that really we should be heading towards. Now, there are other technologies such as Zoom and Teams and things like that, which are have better um, 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 security and, and to that I will point towards a, a document about using online conferencing technologies ah, and very good. <laughs> abuse by the Australian Digital Health Agency but uh, there are also other uh, technologies which are uh, being developed uh, right at this moment because of this move towards telehealth so I'd be looking out for that um, mm -hmm. and, um, and just making sure that um, you start to uh, watch out for this this development because I think the move towards video conferencing is going to be very big in the next uh, uh, few years or so. Yeah, okay. And um, Chris, thank you so much for this conversation. As we start to wind up, I've got two more th thoughts that I'd like you to touch on. One is uh, innovations for private practice owners to sort of be aware of, if there's anything you can share from either the AMA or Digital Health Agency of things that are coming and, uh, you know, great opportunities. And then to wrap us up, your kind of final thoughts and um, advice for people working in private practice. So well, there you go. <laughs> I'll take the first question first, which is I think uh, well done and, and, and it's great, it's brave. Um, I think we really need you out there. I, I think I would definitely point towards uh, uh, resources like these, but um, mm. because I think for most of us, this is just overwhelming and I would definitely head towards this sort of checklist for um, your uh, IT providers so that you can be much more sure about what you're, you're, um, you're uh, being provided with, because I think it's, unfortunately, sometimes you feel as though you've got the, 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 um, uh, the the sort of the uh, you, you can walk into these with your eyes closed um, I would also suggest very strongly that you make a particular point of making sure the data on your systems is as good and as clean as possible particularly with regards to uh, phone numbers and um, um, email addresses of your patients over time because as time goes on they're going to be really critical <laughs> as you, as you build your practices um, I think that the world is moving towards a better place now in terms of digital health. And uh, But what I would say is it's going to be this world where what our aim is, and we can't lose sight of this, this is about good patient care. If you do that first and, and you try to first up make it um, about good quality care so that they get the best care, but also ideally in the most convenient way, that's your main aim. And don't lose sight of that. Don't get too caught up in all the technology. So sometimes you can kind of lose the wood for the trees. And then start to build in things like um, telehealth and uh, um, uh, electronic prescribing, secure messaging, which are firstly hopefully going to improve access to care, going to supplement good face-to-face -face care, are going to um, make it um, also easier for people to be able to get what they want done more quickly. Um, and also, for example, save you time as far as um, being able to contact um, the, the, the instead, of, instead of having to do a phone chase, for example, in the future, you'll be able to uh, securely message somebody. And I think I have one final thing, um, just a little final thought. Uh, is I know that what that may be forgotten, we haven't discussed at the moment, is my health record, which I think is yeah. really the forgotten little thing in there, which is I think for many people, I think they thought that it was supposed to just take off a few years ago. No, my health record was always built up for the long term. So essentially what that is, is essentially a secure Dropbox where health providers who are registered with APRA can obtain information about a patient, which are normally sent by other means like discharge letters or whatever, but which you can obtain. Now at the moment, just uh, if I've got a final thought at the moment, one of the big things at the moment is finding out whether your patient has got, um, has had a COVID vaccine, uh, vaccine already and when they had it. 
And the fastest way to find that out at the moment is through My Health Record because everything that's going through, uh, if they've got a My Health Record, the, the immunisation is going to the Australian Immunisation Registrar and it's going directly into their My Health Record. And there is a summary now there in My Health Record where you can find that out. And once you start to find that out, you see, gee, that's a fast way to find out information. You can then go find out other things that, that may be useful for patient's care where, for example, um, if you're unclear about whether they're being prescribed something from another doctor, you can actually look at it on My Health Record and also find out information about from discharge letters from hospital admissions. So uh, that's something not to be forgotten in all this. Um, so all those bits, which are a combination of first up uh, telehealth, electronic prescribing, secure messaging, My Health Record, are really things that if you can incorporate them in practice, hopefully make the patient's care better, but also uh, your job a lot easier in terms of finding information they need to provide care. Brilliant. The system works. <laughs> Well, you know, look, I think, I think I'll think i flip it the other way and say that sometimes, you, um, you know, we, we have we have bad days on, on uh, electronics and, and, you know, not every day is a perfect day, but when it does work, it can really make things a lot better for you. And overall, 99 uh, days out of 10, I think the, the digital products which are coming out now, particularly if you use them in the right way, uh, do improve patients' care and do improve your ability to get information that you need to provide good care for them. Wonderful. Chris, thank you so much for your time. Those resources are going to be super helpful. Um, they'll, they'll be here where you're watching this video or listening to this recording. And uh, Chris, thanks so much again for your time. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure.